Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for being here. I just want to start by actually playing a piece for you. So let me go over there.
Thank you, everybody. So um, this is the um, the piece that kind of started me on uh, Emma Lou Dietmer's music. And this is the title of my presentation, Extending the Boundaries of Piano Pedagogy, <laughs> Teaching Extended Techniques in the Music of Emma Lou Dietmer. I'm, of course, um, Dr. Amanda Zetlick Wilson. And my inspiration for uh, this particular presentation was I did a, um, I ended up doing a lecture recital in 2011. I feel like I need to have this on, right? <laughs> <laughs> or I'm not official. <laughs> so, so I did a, um, a lecture recital in 2011 and I interviewed Deemer actually and um, it was a very well received project and the interviews were, were very interesting. So I've always wanted to bring it to a larger audience and share it with more people. And um, just, I changed my project a little bit in that I started teaching some of the music to my students. I had played a lot of it, but I wanted to put um, a pedagogy spin on it. So. so to give you a little bit of background, I'm just gonna do this. <laughs> I'm too tall. <laughs> on Deemer, there she is. <laughs> and I forgot to ask, how many of you have played that piece? It's just a show of hands, or taught it before? What's yeah. It um, that is, I'm sorry, that's Toccata for Piano. It's just called Toccata for Piano, and um, she wrote it in 1979. So she was born in, um, in Kansas City, Missouri, November 24th, 1927. She is, um, she's a wonderful pianist and organist, and she's, she's still active um, at, at her age. She's, she's 91 this year, and uh, she's still active performing and composing both, so. Um, she grew up in a very musical family. She had two brothers and a sister. Her sister is a, a known poet. Um, her name is Dorothy Deemer Hendry, and some of you may know, how many know Deemer's music for choral? Yes, um, so she's, she's really well known for her choral music, probably more than her piano music. And, um, but she's taken some of the poetry from her sister's um, work and she said it to, to some of, um, she said it for some of her pieces. And her mother was a pianist and her grandmother also. So very musical family, music all around her when she was growing up. And she began composing at the age of four. Um, she, um, so she was taught by rote initially. Um, her, her teacher didn't teach her how to, how to read until a later um, age. And I'll, I'll show you a video with more, more details from our interviews. But she was a really avid improviser and this kind of sparked her, her composition, her beginning in composition. And she told me that by the age of 12 or 13, she knew she, she wanted to be a composer. I'm not blocking anybody right here. <laughs> and eventually she became um, a professor of theory and composition at the University of Maryland, um, 1965 to 1970. And then she stayed at the University of California, Santa Barbara for quite a while. And that's where she lives today. So that's where I ended up um, interviewing her in her home. Um, we talked a lot about her educational background. Um, she, she told me some of the, the things that the teachers brought to her music education, like specifically. And um, her first teacher was, her name was Mabel Payton. She'll talk about her in one of the videos you'll see. Um, she, so uh, she was just a friend of her mother's and, um, and she just kind of helped her with all the, the fundamentals of music and hand position and relaxation at the piano. Um, Victor Lubunsky was her, her next teacher who was the director of the Kansas City Conservatory at the time. And um, that is a, a picture of him on top, at least as far as I could tell by finding pictures on Google. So if anybody knows <laughs> that that's not him, let me know. Um, she studied with William Gant at Yale and she said that he would help her to find the expression and the essence of the music and the soul of the music. That's how she described it. Um, she studied with Bernard Rogers and Howard Hansen at Eastman, and there's Hansen on the bottom right. 
and he influenced her her composition style highly. Um, he had this um, exercise where she described like he would have the students start in one key and then immediately switch to another key like very abruptly. And she tends to do this in her music too. So you'll you'll notice that sometimes when you're listening. So this is a, this is a video from our actual interviews in 2011 and talking about just what I was telling you about her early life in education and music. Could you just tell me what was your musical background like when you were growing up? Like, did you, what kind of lessons did you take and when did you start? Oh, uh, well, you know, I started, we had piano. Mm -hmm. Piano in the house, which you really have to have if you're going to be a composer. Yeah. Well, you don't have to. You can have a guitar or anything. But a piano really helped. So yeah, we had a piano, and everybody in my family was musical. Oh wow! And my, you know, my brothers and my sister all played instruments, and my mother played the piano, oh. and my grandmother did not real, real heavy classical things, but more lighter music, oh, okay. you know, like popular music, the church music. And did you take lessons from? Like, yeah, I started. You know, when I was maybe. Four or five, I would sit down and pick out things, you know. So mm -hmm. they, my mother knew I was had a musical ear. Yeah, and so she taught me first, and then she got a, a wonderful piano teacher that was a friend of hers, and she came to the house and gave me lessons. And this was in Kansas, Kansas City, Kansas yeah. City. Yeah, and then when we moved to Warrensburg, when I was about nine, I started studying there, but the teacher would not as, as um, understanding of my <laughs> temper. I had actually learned to read music. Okay. And I didn't until I was about nine or so. Oh, okay. And so this teacher was kind of appalled that I didn't read mu music. <laughs> so my mother got on the phone and called Mrs. Payton, my original teacher in Kansas City, and had her come on the bus every week, every two weeks. Mm -hmm to give me lessons. And so I, again, started playing. And, mm -hmm. and I, yeah, and I, I would write little pieces about when, when I was start? about six or seven, I think, and she would write them down. Your teacher? Yeah, my teacher. Did you just get into that on your own, composing, or? Yeah, or? I did. Yeah, nobody told me to. I just uh, would sit down and pick out things. Mm -hmm. First things I had heard in my own music, write my own music. Do you think that not knowing how to read music um, helped you to get into composing ultimately? I think so. Yeah. I improvising think so. Improvising a lot. Yeah, improvising exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, it was good to read music too eventually. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, that's a good point that I think it was important. I promise that was me. You, you can see I like to change my hair a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a photo we took together when I was um, visiting and interviewing Deemer in 2011. We were at her house for two days, and I just I interviewed her um, for quite a while. I had like hours of footage and <laughs> made it into somehow made it into a lecture recital. So that's at her home, on her balcony there. Um, so it, how it all started for me, as I said, um, I started with the, the Toccata for piano. My, my undergrad teacher had recommended it to me a long time ago, and some of the grad students played it, I remembered, and I thought, someday, someday I'll play that. And it took me until I was in my doctoral program. <laughs> I was like, I should probably learn that piece. That'd be a good idea. So um, so I finally I finally learned it. And I had seen so many lecture recitals over the years, like from when I started my undergraduate. I was like, oh my gosh, what am I gonna do for my project? Like, everything's been done. Um, so with my, uh, my graduate teacher, uh, we kind of came up with the idea like, oh, well, Deemer, uh, she's in California. What if you interview her? Um, why don't you just try to get in touch with her? And I was like, well, maybe, maybe she'll answer. And, and she's, 
she's very savvy with technology, so <laughs> luckily, um, that's to her credit. And um, so I turned that into my first lecture recital. And it was the first time probably I interviewed anybody on ca camera. <laughs> you can tell I was a little nervous. Um, so this was my, uh, my lecture recital that I came up with was Extended Keyboard Techniques and Compositional Philosophy, A Conversation with Emma Lou Deemer, which I have conveniently on YouTube. If anybody wants to, to look it up, um, if you search for, for me on, on YouTube, you'll find it pretty easily. And something else that was very, very awesome that came out of this was that I ended up commissioning a piece by her, and um, this was something that we kind of joked about when I was interviewing her. She was talking about some people not being happy with the pieces they commissioned and they didn't perform them, and I was like, you can write a piece for me sometime. <laughs> and I, of course, I mentioned it to my teacher, and she's like, why don't you ask her? Why don't you ask her to compose a piece? And I just had never thought about that, so so I tried it, and she, um, she agreed to compose me a piece, and charged me like 20 bucks for it. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I'm gonna apply for a grant, what do I owe you? She's like, 20 bucks. <laughs> so, so that was Takata for Amanda, which she finished in 2012. And then I actually, um, well I played it a, a few times before this, but I premiered it, premiered it officially on my solo recital in 2014. And then I commissioned a second piece, because that was so much fun. Um, anybody in MUFI in the room? Hi. <laughs> so um, the 2017 convention was in Denver. And Deemer is a MUFI composer. Um, and I just thought, oh, they're going to love it if I you know, get a piece written t just to play at the convention. So I did. I, I have a violin piano duo, and I asked her to write something for that. And she, she wrote me. Um, Variations on our triangle, which is the song of Mi Phi Epsilon. So this is like appeal of Deemer's music, more from a performer's perspective um, first. So I think it ap appeals to people that are a little bit more rebellious, as in like, not like I'm gonna, you know, get get in trouble and like get arrested or something, but like. <laughs> Like, more just, I don't want to do what everybody else does, you know? Um, and I've always been kind of like that um, in my adult life. Like, I, I kind of like to do things a little bit differently than other people. And um, I was like, yeah, this music is, re this is really interesting. This is different than what everyone else plays. Um, it's, you know, it gets a response from people, which is, which is cool. And usually it's really positive. Sometimes I worry about, like, more traditional crowds when I play it, and I'm like, I hope they like it. And they always come up to me and they're like, that was great, I love it. <laughs> so um, just the, the new compositional ideas, like the, um, not new, not that new, but you know, new as in not, not so classical, like the playing on the strings and the cool sound effects you get to make. And they're, and they're not, um, none of them are very complicated. Like, you don't have to do a whole lot of marking of the strings or anything like that, you can, which I'll I'll bring that up in some of the the student pieces later. Um, sp strengthens improvisational skills. So she talked a lot about improvising, and I feel like it strengthened my improvisational skills. Um, maybe because I've I've played a lot of it memorized, and I get lost sometimes, <laughs> and I have to make up something to get back to what um, where I am, and that's not something I've always been good at. Um, and I feel like I can do it kind of seamlessly now. So maybe it strengthens my improvisational skills too. <laughs> it's just a lot of fun to play and it's challenging and I like a challenge always. And um, again, exploring the, the creative ways of playing and the creative ways of um, that she writes her pieces. Like she doesn't always use all the conventions that we're used to. Like, signatures and sometimes no bar lines and and just forces everyone to to think about music in different ways um, as a performer and as a listener too 
Oh, and humor. She's um, she infuses humor into a lot of her titles, and and just the some of the some of the um, surprises in the music that you'll you'll get to see in some of the videos that I have for you. So the, now the benefits to teaching, um, and this has only been more recently for me. I don't know why I didn't think to start uh, teaching it sooner, but it made sense, and it's helped a lot of my students. So this is um, playing it and also listening. Like when I when I played when I learned the Takata for piano specifically, and I played it for my students. Like all the little kids were, went crazy. They were just like. I want to play the inside of the piano. Like, <laughs> they just loved it, and um, it just kind of sparked this new interest in them. Um, so I have some students that that um, are composers. They they like to they like to compose. Anyone have composers in their studio? Yeah. So I think that it just shows them different ways. Her music shows them different ways that that they could bring extended techniques or just different harmonies into their music. And sometimes we have those struggling students that kind of don't want to practice and or they're getting to a difficult age, like where they're kind of like, oh maybe I want to quit piano. You know, they have these these rough patches and I think um, this repertoire can help with that. Like it's just something really different from what they're used to playing and what they're like expected to play. And then, of course, appeals to the musically adventurous students like like myself. And um, just helping students to be open to this style of music in the future. Like, one of the, to the point of um, me being rebellious, I had some friends like in my grad school years that they just had like zero interest in learning something like this. And that made me kind of say like, well, I want to learn it, you know? <laughs> and um, I think it's kind of like, you know, when you introduce children to this sort of repertoire when they're younger, they're, they're going to be more open to music that sounds different. Like, as an example, kind of like when you, you don't introduce children to different foods when they're younger. Like, they're, they're not, um, they won't be as adventurous eating. My husband's gonna hate me for saying this, but I, I love um, poking fun at his him and his brothers and sisters because they are they're all very picky eaters. So, <laughs> so music can be the same way, you know. You can be very kind of closed off to new ideas, new ideas. Like that's okay. I'll just play Bach and you know, Mozart and Beethoven. And I think introducing this um, early on is helpful to keep them open. And um, something surprising that I found um, that I didn't expect is that, well, I should have expected it, because when you teach a new piece you know, to your students that you've played, it's always gonna make you understand it differently. But I've, I've been playing like that piece for eight years or something, and I just recently have taught it to a couple of teenagers. And um, I found a couple of things that I've been playing wrong for like eight years, so. <laughs> So um, this is a video of uh, from our interviews, and where she's talking about reception of her music, and maybe some of these like adults that didn't get to hear contemporary music when they were younger, and they kind of like look give her some side eye or something when they <laughs> listen to her her music and they don't like it so much. When I when I played that for music club, there was the ending. You know, it has a big ending. Yeah, and and some woman said, "Oh, she wasn't <laughs> sure about tunes." People react very strangely sometimes. To yeah. If it's a little bit too, what they perceive as being a little too violent. Uh huh. It, I guess it offends them. The Mozart lover. <laughs> I was wondering what the most uh, interesting reaction you've gotten to one of your pieces has been, because we were talking about some people were <laughs> when you played your sonata. Yeah. People were, oh. You know. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Uh, all kinds, and uh, it seems like whenever I would have something done, like an orchestra piece, mm -hmm. in the slow sections, 
people are coughing, you know, oh, yeah. you're making, there's so, something about, maybe the music, it makes them nervous, maybe, if it's not oh. in G major, you know, or right. not Mozart right. or Haydn, and, and maybe so then when, maybe they've been coughing all the time, I don't know, but you <laughs> notice it in a right. soft in section. Right, slow movement. Or, mm -hmm. And you notice every little thing that people say, yeah, I remember, I did some electronic music, mm -hmm. when I, particularly when I was in the DCSB. Yeah. And once at the music academy, I had a, te a tape mm -hmm. piece played, and it began kind of with a drum sound, mm -hmm. the back electronic. Type. Yeah. Electronic. And these two women wanted to know what that wo noise was. <laughs> what was that noise? <laughs> During the piece or it, it afterwards? Had just begun. It had just oh. Begun. They asked afterwards, or they were asking. They didn't like, really know it had begun, you know, oh. because nobody had come out to direct it. Oh, that's it. funny. Oh, they that's just funny. heard this sound. Right. And then, um, yeah, I've had comments that were, I thought, sort of uncalled for, mm -hmm. and yeah. because it had a sort of wild cello piano piece played. Yeah. At the, I don't know, some kind of a gathering. I think it was in someone's home, and. The husband of the woman who was, mm -hmm. you know, they, it was their house, and I forget what it was he said. He didn't. He obviously didn't like it, and I intimated that that was me. You know, anything you write yeah. has something of yourself in it. Right. So he was saying, "Oh, that's bad," or something. <laughs> that's you. Oh no. Uh -oh. <laughs> Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about some intermediate repertoire that um, some of which I, I have taught to my students now. So these two um, time pictures and sound pictures, I've had the, um, the scores for a while, but I haven't had a chance. To, to teach them, and I do have everything up here if anyone wants to look later on. Um, but I, so I don't, I don't, um, I'm not super familiar with these two, but I think they, they seem like great pieces. They're just a little bit more simple, and I haven't had a chance, I haven't had like a student that was quite um, in the right place for these. But um, I have done a lot with Space Suite which is a really neat set of pieces. Um, it was written for, a, like a commission for Clavier Magazine. And um, they, a lot of them have extended techniques and they get to make like, sort of like outer space kind of um, sound effects. So, and they have, they have outer space themed <laughs> titles. And some of them are not, some of them are on the keys, just played on the keys traditionally. And I have all the, the publishing info for these if anyone's interested, and I'm also planning to make a handout available later on, so you don't have to furiously write everything down. <laughs> and um, minimal listing is one that I've found um, more recently. It was actually, I, I asked Deemer, I told her about this presentation, I told her um, I was planning to teach to some of my students her pieces, and I asked for some more music. Um, some more sheet music, and she sent me this one, and it has, it's like actually an anthology with a bunch of different contemporary composers um, that I'm forgetting the title of at the moment. Contemporary Collage, Music of the 21st Century. And, um, and so Minimalisting is from this. So it's kind of a fast and fun minimalist piece. And, um, and the one, the other one that she has in this uh, collection is Thinking Back, and it's a more introspective, um, slower piece. So just to say a little bit about, I, these are gonna be videos of my students playing. And um, so this particular student, um, she is in, in high school, she's, she's a younger high school student, and she has some, some trouble being motivated to practice. She's a very s sweet girl and she's, she's a good student. Um, but I feel like these pieces were so different for her and they sparked her interest a lot and she was practicing more um, 
I don't know, maybe she just really wanted to be in my presentation, but she was, <laughs> she was practicing more. <laughs> so you can get a little sample. This is like one of the space suite pieces. This would be a good one for marking the the hammers or the, the dampers with um, like some little post-its so they can find it easier. I'm just going to move past this one for now because I think we've seen all the, the effects and we can come back to things if we have more time. Um, and this one is um, from, the same, from the same collection, Out in Space. Um, so this particular student, and I, I wanted to speak a little bit about my, um, the title, uh, Extended Techniques, about extended techniques. Um, it just that the extended techniques are what got me interested in her music, but I wanted to also include um, some of the more like traditional on the keys pieces, because Sometimes the, there are students that are more interested in like the, like what they would call like the weird music and <laughs> like the you know playing on the the strings and some of them are m want um, more pretty pieces and and Deemer has both of those so she's her um, repertoire is varied um, so this particular student is um, he is high functioning autistic. And he's a great student. He's very advanced um, in his his level and his age, and um, he just he has a hard time focusing, of course. And um, and he gets he's not as good with um, detail. When I ask him to, you know, um, add dynamics, I have to remind him a lot. And with these pieces, I think um, they were they were more challenging to him, and they had like fun harmonies. And he has this this joke lately where he'll play a piece and he'll end it on the wrong chord. You know, he'll like play it perfectly and then he'll like do like a crazy chord at the end, <laughs> and his, it drives his mom crazy. Um, but I think these were these harmonies were different and um, adventurous, and he likes that, and he likes the the technical aspect to it, the challenging technical aspect. So he's minimalisting.
And then this is that contrasting piece from the same group, um, from the same collection of pieces. And he doesn't enjoy this one quite as much as he loves playing fast music, but um, I can I can tell he likes it um, also because he's adding the dynamics without so much asking. And um, so this is um, the same student on Thinking Back. some fun with the Mozart action figure there. <laughs> and, um, this is from the, um, this is a collection of her, all hers. It's called Travels Through Sound. And um, it does have, um, it has both traditional on the keys and extended techniques. Um, this is one of the, the prettier ones that um, a couple of my students have they weren't, I played a lot, I played through a lot of pieces for them, and this is the one they were interested in. It's, it is a really nice piece, so. And you can talk to him about ostinato. So this is a, a student that um, likes to, he's not too into all the traditional music. He's always bringing me video game music and he's always like, I wanna show you this video game song on YouTube or something. Um, so he, he does play the, the classical pieces but he's, he's more interested in something different. And um, the, I feel like this piece is a little, a little subdued for him but it's still, it's still a very nice piece and, we're working on like, okay, what's the story during this this piece? Like, what's happening while you're sailing on the quiet sea? this one because I want to get to some of the advanced repertoire too. Um, I did have um, some of my students, my older students working on pieces but they weren't quite ready to to be videoed for whatever reason. So I have a lot of um, 
I have some videos of, of myself playing um, some of the pieces I'm talking about. Um, so she has some, she has these seven etudes that are very interesting. She's given me the sheet music for these. I, I want to learn those in the future. They're, um, some of them are dedicated to um, different composers and they are written in those composers' style, such as Rachmaninoff and Schoenberg. And they're, they're pretty challenging. They're, they're high level um, of difficulty. And then of course the Toccata for Piano, which was written for a student at UCSB for her senior recital. And she, she had fairly um, small hands. So it's, it's not an easy piece, but it has smaller reaches. So that's good to know for, for people that are looking for that. I've played her Sonata Number no. Three. It's a wonderful piece. It's um, it has a fun. It, the first piece, is, uh, the first movement is like a serenade, and it's it's fairly fast. And the, mo the second movement is really beautiful. The third one is um, Toccata Fantastique, and I really love that movement. And I hear I see some nodding back there. Have you played it? Or? Yes, I have. Yeah, that's that is a really fun piece um, to play, and it's very exciting and. Um, sort of has like that like violent sort of edge to it, like she was talking about in, in her um, interview, in my interview with her. And it does have some extended techniques in it. And it was inspired by a trip that she took to Argentina, which is kind of interesting. And then the, the Psalms are um, a newer piece for me. Um, because I had recently, I had a concert, I had to play some sacred solo music, and um, I realized that I didn't have any for <laughs> it, it, which was really surprising to me. Um, this is the, the Psalms, and again, you guys can look at the, the scores if you come up after. Um, so these are, these are fairly short, and they're, they're challenging, they're very challenging, and um, they are, they're varied, you know, they're, there are um, a lot of different characters in them, and um, they don't take up a lot of time if you want to just do two or, or three. So, and then of course the Takara for Amanda, and the subtitle for that is the homage to the minimalist and Antonio Vivaldi. So you can kind of see a little bit of her her humor in that. Um, and the first thing I have, as far as video of me here is um, one of the psalms. It, it's for um, Psalm 16. My friend was trying to do an artsy video, so I'm sorry about that. It's not really focused on the piano. I'm not going to play all these for you right now, but you can kind of hear one of the faster ones. Um, so I'll play you some of Psalm 26, and we can come back if we have time to.
And one of the things about that, uh, about this group of pieces um, for teaching purposes is that she has a couple of um, the more difficult psalms. I, I can't remember the numbers at the moment, um, but a couple of them that are written in an easier um, arrangement. So if, if any of your students wanted to play them but they're a little bit too challenging, um, you could still you could still have them learn it. Um, so I, I have a, I wanted to play a little bit of the piece I commissioned, but I wanted to give you an idea. Of, we only had like one mu fi person in the room, right? Or maybe a couple. How many mu fi's? Yeah. So I want to give everybody else an idea of like how what this the piece is actually like. So it's like a very happy piece, and it's like you know talks about friendship and flowers. And then you'll see her humor, like when she kind of gets her um, her uh, spin on it, and like everybody kind of like chuckling because it's because <laughs> um, it's very it is funny. So. <laughs> The song of me five epsilons, and this is at the um, convention with my violinist friend. I'm gonna stop it there, but I do have that on my YouTube channel as well in the entirety. Um, so I have a couple of more video clips of Deemer, and um, this was a question about her um, future projects that she would be working on, and she talks a little bit about her compositional style and what makes her compositional style unique. What is your, what are the pieces like that you've been composing recently, or the most recently? Well, I've written some chamber music recently, mm -hmm. and I think probably any anything I write has a now it has an eclectic feel feel to it. In other mm -hmm. words, some of it is it can be very tonal sometimes or modal, yeah, or it can be quite dissonant. Mm -hmm. So or a mixture of all the things yeah, you've right. you've tried. Yeah. Is there anything you're working on right now? Planning yeah. to yeah, I'm working, working on a couple of things. I'm working on a. I, I'm supposed to write something for youth youth choir for mm -hmm. for a group in um, I think it's 
a viral or mm -hmm. and that so I'm, I'll use a song. It'll mm -hmm. be a song setting. I've done lots of song settings. Lots yeah. of biblical settings. And then so that's gonna have a certain feel to it. It's gonna it needs to appeal to young people. Right. And then right. I'm <coughs> doing something a trio for piano and trumpet and trombone. Oh. And that is going to have a different sound to it. You know, when you're using brass. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so I think I'm going to have a little bit of. I've just, I've really not done any theatrics, you know, in my music because I really like absolute music. I like. I'm not one to have people, you know, sitting on, on a tire or yeah. something and playing a flute. Or I mean, I I know a lot of students have done that, and that's okay. But it's not something I much point in it. I mean, I, I like the music. Yeah, yeah, I like the music. Mm -hmm. And when you start introducing other elements, they yeah, take distracting. Away. Yeah. yeah. But, but with this trio, I am going to have the trumpet and the trombone start in the wings, start out mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Play, play some kind of a duet there yeah. and then come to the center of the stage. Well, that sounds really, really cool. And a couple of places where they're going to play into the piano, you know, put oh, the pedal down. Okay. Have you done that before with your? No, I haven't done that. Chamber. But many composers have. Yeah. You know, they're always doing things that I have maybe getting around to eventually. Mm -hmm. But just something a little bit different. I'll have to ask her if she composed those pieces. So, and then this is one final video. Um, where I had asked her about some advice for listeners and performers that she has for them. What do you hope that, if anything, what, what do you hope people would get out of playing your music or listening to your music? Like, if you could, if you could hope that they get something from it or take something away. Oh, yeah, something uh, positive. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I yeah. think uh, you want them to feel the same way you did when you wrote it. Yeah, and that's so get, a, a, get a glimpse of what yeah. you and that's a little thinking. subjective because people react differently to music. Um, however, there's there are kinds of music, as I said before, that you can write that are audience friendly. Right. And you know that right. most people are probably going to like it. However, there are always people at the extreme end who prefer music a lot more adventurous or a lot more dissonant or mm -hmm. of a different style. But you hope that uh, somebody will get something out of it. Mm -hmm. And I have, I've had a lot of good comments about my music. People will say, I never liked contemporary music until I yeah. got it. You know, and, and that's fine with me. I'm glad when they say that. Yeah, because, that's, that's yeah, because I don't yeah. set about to displease people. Mm -hmm. Sometimes <laughs> I don't really care you know, what they think of the music. <laughs> something I want to write. Mm -hmm. But ordinarily, it would be nice if people had some, something that was good for them. Right. You know, because you, we know what music does for us. Mm -hmm. And so therefore, it would be nice to write music that does that for other people. Okay, and then I have one um, final uh, slide with, I, I use this book a lot um, when I was preparing my lecture recital, probably both of my lecture recitals. Um, it's a biobibliography of Deemer, and it was it only goes up to 2001, so it doesn't include everything that I've talked about today, but it is very useful. And um, yeah, I, I used it from the CU library, and I had to get myself a copy because <laughs> I, I needed that. And um, then, of course, my two <laughs> lecture recitals you can find on YouTube as well. And I'm happy to share my papers with anybody if um, you want to contact me. Um, and, and then just, uh, I took those two photos of her when I was visiting. And that's not my photo, but it's a really good photo of her. <laughs> um, so she's just a really a wonderful lady. and. Um, just a, a prolific, really prolific composer, and I just wanted to share more with everybody because she's not, she's she's not as well known as she should be, and 
she's um, like a national treasure, you know, she's, she's just um, so active and she, there's so many wonderful pieces out there for, for every um, musical medium, not just piano. So I know, we, I know we're running close to time, but does anybody have any questions? How much of the intermediate repertoire has extended techniques? I mean, how much is it uh, just traditional writing? Yeah, um, to me, I, I think it's, it, seems about, it seems about equal, but maybe, maybe more traditional and, and close to the same amount extended techniques. But um, yeah, I certainly haven't, I haven't done all of it. And um, I, I mean, I, I included quite a few of the, the intermediate repertoire collections, but I, I don't think I got everything in there. Um, and most of it is, is in, in here. So, did that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Um, I had planned to, to play some of, at least some of the, um, the Toccata for Amanda, but I do have that also on YouTube. So I have like a few recordings of that on YouTube if you want to check that out. And that is also available um, from the publisher too. Can I ask another question? Of course. <laughs> On an upright, have you taught any of the advanced techniques? That's a good point. Um, so yes, that is something that I actually wanted to mention. Some of the pieces um, she has, she actually has like an alternative way of playing it. If you can't play it, you know, if you have an upright, um, if, like if playing it on the keys. But um, I haven't I haven't taught it on an upright because I'm I'm teaching mostly in my studio and I and I have a grand, but um, I have played extended techniques on an on an upright before, and so it's possible. <laughs> it's just it's not easy like on every piano. To, like I was I was practicing on a on a Steinway upright yesterday and I found it was really easy to just like it, just open it up and like slide the slide the uh, top like into the piano. So, but I, I don't think all uprights are easy to practice on. So that's another, you know, I could practice extended techniques on. So I think that's another um, reason why a lot of my students picked the traditional pieces because they don't have grand pianos. Anybody else? Right. Yes. Um, it takes a little bit. There's a little bit of a learning curve with that, but um, they're they're all like really eager to figure it out because yeah. it's so different and, and new. So there and are there are instructions. Yes. And um, she mentioned about like the clavier, the one that she um, commissioned for or commit clavier commissioned from her, um, which is Space Suite. Um, she uh, there were some people that were kind of like. Ooh, why would I want to play this? And like the piano is gonna get dirty or something. <laughs> but she has like um, she has this nice like I don't know if it was right at the beginning or what. But she has like an instruction. Um, yeah, she has like this whole thing of instructions like at the front um, that tells you like this is how to do it safely and like make sure your hands are clean and you know all this and and I make sure my students know to do that too and they. Like okay, wash your hands, and you know, so you don't turn the strings black or something. So, <laughs> hi, Grace. Amanda, I've had my students play some of those pieces. Students love it, but yeah. what about the parents? Oh, my yes. Was parents thought something <laughs> that was not right. I have some parents that are super into it, and they're like, "Oh, this is so cool." I have, I've had like. Sometimes, you know, the students' parents aren't there, so I don't know how they feel about it, but I did have one um, <laughs> one older student that her mom was like, oh, that sounds like a horror movie. <laughs> so I just, but she's like, she's a really cool mom, so I just kind of joke with her. I'm like, oh, mom, we're going to play your favorite piece now. <laughs> and she's, she's fine with it. She's just, she doesn't like it as much as, like, the pretty, like, like the Mozart concerto that she's working on. <laughs> Anybody else have questions? Well, thank you so much. You've been a wonderful audience. And it's my first time presenting, so you made it really easy on me. <laughs>